All right, what is it? It is a 2020 Range Rover Sport. Do you like the aluminum? Don't bring Jason into this. He can't save you now. I'd rather be detailing cars right now than <laughs> doing this. What, what about Rover 2.0? What about Nicki Minaj? These people have distinguished tastes, and I bring you the best. I need to be start. I need to start rapping. Rapping cars or rapping? No, rapping in as in musical talent. You and Vanilla Ice, right? No, I, I would. Robert be, Van Winkle. Excuse no, me. I'd be next level, dude. I I got I I grew up. The mean I, streets of McHenry? No, I grew up in the mean streets of my gated community. <laughs> I have a lot to say that's going to help people. So let's talk about this thing. I see things that I don't want to see, but apparently there's a lot of technology here. Yes, it is a Range Rover, Mark. It is a all-wheel drive capable off-roading machine. You can storm the local Whole Foods in this thing. I see what I brought here. This is my luggage because I know I'm gonna get stranded in this thing <laughs> and I'm gonna have to live out of my suitcase for a couple months. You wanna know why Range Rover owners never waved one another? They met earlier that day at the service shop. I'm over this, dude, you finish it. <laughs> well, now that Mark stormed off, this, this car has five engines. This particular one is an inline six with 355 horsepower. You have a PHEV uh, variant of this with 400 horsepower, Mark, come back. So Mark, you're back. I managed to wrangle you back because this has five engine options. The Range Rover Sport has a four-cylinder plug-in hybrid, two mild hybrid six-cylinder inline sixes, and two V8s. Is that what you want? You want the V8? I don't want any of them, <laughs> but if I was gonna have this, the V8 would be ideal to the character of what this is trying to do. This is a four-wheel drive system that is a true electronic diff that has various drive modes that are tied into the air ride suspension. It's very capable. Whether or not anyone's actually gonna take this off-road is irrelevant, but this is why you buy this car. This is why it costs more than its, say, X5 or Q7 counterparts, the mechanical differential. Right, this is one of the things that Land Rover is, aside from maybe like the upper-end truck Toyotas, this would be why you would get it. It's an all-aluminum architecture. All aluminum, this looks like steel, for, no, it's all aluminum with adhesives. The body structure is way lighter. Your subframe carrier, your knuckle design, all of the suspension stuff is aluminum with the exception of your lower control arms, which are steel and the front arm is all steel. And this is most likely because steel will deflect and bend if you hit an impact versus crack like aluminum. So if you're going off road, that's, that's kind of what you would want. But other than that, the center differential is magic. It adds this here, and that's what hurts the efficiency as well. But it gives the vehicle the ability, ability in auto mode to kind of adapt to its environment. But you can manually choose your terrain modes. And this is where I started to play around in the snow last night, because when it's in auto, basically the traction control is like just keeping it from doing anything. But when I switched it into sand, just to see how the behavior would change, you could see that the center differential would lock send all its power to the rear and it would it would really rotate around without understeering. So you have the ability to choose those modes, but it's so intelligent based on ride height sensors. It can adjust each corner with air ride. This, this is, would be amazing off-road and I don't think anybody's gonna take it there, but again, this is the magic of it. Yeah, I mean, it's really player's choice. I just don't feel like most people are ever gonna utilize this, so their money is maybe better spent elsewhere. Maybe. And if you have the money, absolutely lease it because a lot of the problems that you see with Land Rovers or Range Rovers in general, suspension costs, like your air compressor, your air springs are super expensive. One single damper on here is almost $600 for one shock. Um, and these are common replacement items, the common wear items, knuckles, all this are gonna be insanely expensive. So if you lease this, the, mechanically you don't have to worry. Now there, the, the, there's a whole other topic about that, but. I think this would be very fun to drive with a V8. I agree. But let's get it out on the road and see how it is as it stands. What's the point of a gated community if I can't get the guard to be there when I'm there? Well, you're John Business after all, Mark. 
You're damn right I'm John Business. I'm always doing deals in this or listening to Rover 2.0. <laughs> so we're in the 2020 Range Rover Sport HSE. And uh, despite its name in this particular trim, it is not very sporty. It has captain's chairs, heated and cooled seats. You have this commanding view of the poor people around you. You have a truly usable back seat. And you can put your caviar in this heated, sorry, cooled uh, center armrest. It's uh, quite premium. Let's talk about the interior, Jack, because really that's what this is about. This is a, one of the main reasons people like Land Rover or Range Rover. Other than the badge. Us. Yeah, so the badge. <laughs> so what does it have going for it? It is extremely quiet compared to the X5 we had last week, which was a executive X5 with the acoustic glass. This is quieter. It is a complete isolation chamber. You have a sense of effortless executive luxury in this car. <laughs> or at least that's what uh, JLR says. Yeah, okay, whatever that means. There's so much marketing mumbo-jumbo that they slap onto this that makes you think that it's way better than it is. But there is a lot going on here in terms of interior design that in some cases is great because yeah. it does have a very clean aesthetic, a very modern aesthetic. And the technology is a total other point. But when you look at this objectively from the glove box, the design of the center area with the leather across the dash, the upper part of the dash, the door design. I really, that's the best part about this to me. It'll the, age well, minus the screens, it'll yes. age very well. You'll know it's a Range Rover. I mean, I know that seems odd, but JLR historically has done interiors pretty well from a leather aesthetic design. Their kind of letdown though has always been their technology. Yeah, the technology is supposed to be a highlight in here and it winds up being a pretty big low light. This is the same dual screen infotainment that I saw in the Velar and I thought that they would have had some firmware or software updates to it. This was designed in collaboration with Panasonic Automotive and Panasonic is one of the biggest uh, OEMs for interior car infotainment. They spend a ton of time with multiple manufacturers and many cars. It's great. In the case of this, it's not that it's implemented bad. A lot of it is super logical, but it is so slow and laggy. I mean, there's no excuse for me to hit the setting button and to wait two seconds and then hit the audio settings button and have a third, like a, a little, like a, a second delay. All the functions lag and it still has the same thing where you hit the, the steering wheel heater. Sometimes it doesn't register your touches right away. A lot of these things should be instantaneous. I agree. At this price point, and this level of technology should be perfected, and that's my big problem with this. Regardless of the badge, if I have $100,000 I'm going to spend, I want to know that all of this works, and it doesn't. That's the problem with this car. There are good features, right? There's a ton of storage. This by far has the most usable back seat in any SUV I've used in this segment. I really can fit behind myself comfortably. You have a badass moonroof one of the best audio systems we've ever tested. It's a little worse than the Volvo S60 Bowers and Wilkins, but if you don't know any better, and this isn't the full-blown Meridian system, this one does not have 3D audio, it's incredible. It is, and let's talk about the audio system for a minute. I got in here and there's three different settings. You have DTS Neural, you have uh, ProLogic 2X, and Meridian has their own EQ setting, and of course, the basic the, stereo. The stereo. The best setting that has the biggest wow factor is the Meridian setting. It sounds pretty natural. It has really great brightness, good bass. It's very flat sounding. And the, Im the imaging too is excellent. The it's imaging, textbook. Yeah, it's, it's very good. There is some negatives to it though. As I started really delving into it, the Meridian setting has some type of stereo expander setting. So what you would expect to hear has a much wider sound stage. The vocals specifically in a lot of music gets split out wider. It's not as focused, but I would say it's a minor gripe uh, because you would say, why don't you just use the stereo mode? Well, the stereo mode has, it sounds like to me, it has some lower high pass filter on it. When you get a sudden increase of volume in bass or treble, it cuts the volume down. And I've noticed it and there's no setting for it. So if you're gonna use this, Definitely keep it on the Meridian setting and keep your EQ flat and you'll be very, very impressed with it. The menus themselves for the audio systems are logical and thankfully, unlike what you get in a BMW, the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is not wireless, which means when you plug it in, it works. You can get around some of the graphics and the, let's call it, 
user issues with the infotainment if you stick to those two systems, but it's still slow. It's to me this entire this entire thing is way too slow from what it is. When you boot this car up or you turn it on and it's booting up the system, your HVAC controls aren't accessible right away. I'll hit the ring to get the seat heater or seat cooler on. It still takes like five or six seconds for that to come up. That's not okay to me. And that's one of the biggest deal breakers of this car, despite it being quite honestly, very impressive in other ways. I like the motor. It has a really good sound to it. It does. And it has, a, and I know it's because the all wheel drive or four wheel drive system has a center diff. So you get driveline vibration through this car and you'll notice it during shifts. You'll feel a vibration from underneath the rear of the car. And I like that a lot. It's not completely removing the drivetrain out of it. So you feel something. And then, you know, most people aren't gonna drive it like that, but that's something I like and most people don't. <laughs> The inline six in this car is very smooth, but because it's so heavy, so with the new architecture that they updated in 2014, I believe, they went all aluminum, so they lost weight. However, when they went to the three liter and went away from their supercharged V6s, they gained weight, a ton of weight. It's like 500 pounds. Wow. So <clears throat> the solution to this is the five liter supercharged V8 that they have. I know it's more money, but by the time you option one of these out, the standard features on the V8 end up being cheaper than the V6, sorry, the inline six options. It is far superior as a power plant. If you're spending hundred grand, you don't really care about fuel economy. You want a smooth power band that's effortless and you have to wind this inline six out. Yeah, you do. And I think the, the negative part about it is there is a lot of delay when you, you punch it off the line. So you have to be ready for that. Um, it, it just does not get off the line well, but once it gets past like that 1500 RPMs, it really does pull. It sounds great. There's, I mean, an effortless power here. And I, I don't even think, you know, do you need to spend the extra money? If you have it, I would just obviously go for the V8s. But in this case, this is fine for me, honestly. It's so quiet, it's so refined. The air suspension is great over every single pavement type. You have a great command of the road and all, it might almost be too high for certain people. But this, this is a very, very comfortable, uh, capable SUV. If you're going to use it for its intended purposes of tackling odd terrain, if you're not gonna use this off-road, it doesn't make a lot of sense aside from the badge. No, it, it really doesn't. The X5 has a far superior driving experience other than the steering. The steering in this is better. But this car doesn't, at least in its particular trim with this engine, does not pretend to be sporty. There are basically two drive modes, eco and yeah. comfort. And well, then all the other ones are wheel, terrain yeah. select for, for going off-road. And I would say 90% of the settings are for going off-road. And that if this is just gonna be an urban cruiser, I feel like something like the XC90, it does a better job at combining all this. And the X5 or X7 does a better job with the drivetrain, transmission, engine options. It just doesn't ride as good as this. This is why you buy it. It is so quiet. It's super comfortable over everything. And it does carry that prestige value of that the Range Rover carries. And if that's what you're looking for, that's why you would buy this. But let's head into the final thoughts and talk about some of the other nuances. Final thoughts on the Land Rover Sport. Fundamentally and objectively, there's absolutely minimal things wrong with this. It rides amazing with the air suspension. It's got one of the most capable all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive systems in the industry from a electronic control perspective, from a suspension control perspective on a luxury type car. The inline six, the V8, they feel really good on here. The overall design is extremely attractive. They've always had great designs. The interior design, electronics aside, is also great. So you might think, why is there this level of downplaying in the video? And I gotta say, if you're buying it new as a leased vehicle and you have any inclination to actually use its abilities, you're gonna enjoy it. If you're just gonna roll around in it as a luxury car, a lot of the all-wheel drive system, the things that makes it special is gonna be completely lost. There are other vehicles that do the luxury part better, the refinement a little bit better, 
and specifically the electronics better. The infotainment is not where it needs to be if you're big into that. So you got to weigh the pluses and minuses. And I think at around $100,000 with the way this is spec'd out, I mean, well, basically anywhere from eighty dollars to $100,000 how you spec it out, that's a lot of coin and there's a ton of competition there. So I really appreciated the things that it did well, but there's no way that I could recommend at this point with, with the way that it's built is something that you would ever finance or buy cash unless you just had disposable income. But as a leased vehicle, I can see a huge majority of people putting this up against the the Q7s, the Q5s, the X5s, X7s, the XC90. And I think the XC90 kind of elevates a lot of what this is trying to do and drops a lot of the complication in the all-wheel drive system. Those would be kind of the, the models that I would look at compared to this. But again, this is all up to you. If you love the Range Rover brand and moniker, just go out there, drive it. You're probably going to love it regardless of all this stuff. You're just not going to care. But hopefully this video is somewhat watchable and entertaining. Thanks. I'll see you next time. <music>